Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show. Today, bringing you another really fascinating guest involved in creating a better tomorrow and a safer tomorrow uh, for all of us. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined uh, by Ambassador Dr. Bonnie Jenkins, Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security at the United States Department of State. There she leads uh, three bureaus. And in addition to that, uh, as of May of last year, uh, she also became in charge of the, uh, the department's efforts on the AUKUS uh, Trilateral Security Partnership for the, uh, the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, prior to this role, Ambassador Jenkins uh, served in the Obama administration as special envoy uh, and coordinator for threat reduction programs in the Bureau of uh, International Security and Nonproliferation. There she coordinated all uh, America efforts on uh, threat reduction uh, in regards to the chemical, biologic, Nuclear and radiological security was the State Department's lead for nuclear security summits. Has an amazing CV, uh, undergraduate degree from Amherst, master's of public administration from uh, State University of New York, master's in international comparative law from Georgetown. PhD from University of Virginia uh, and a law degree from Albany Law School. And while she did her law degree, she also served in the reserves uh, and rose to the rank of Lieutenant Commander. Uh, a lot of really important themes to get into today. We will put her full bio in the uh, in the show episode, um, but a lot to get into. Uh, Ambassador Dr. Jenkins, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Great. Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you. Yeah, and no, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, love to start things off, you know, as we typically do by by handing you the floor for a little bit to uh, sort of go back to the, the early days, uh, growing up in the South Bronx, a little bit of your early journey uh, into public service, into law, and a, a little bit of what got you focused on on the theme of international arms control. I'd love to hear that early part of the story. Great. Thanks. Thanks for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk about that. Um, yes, as you mentioned, I grew up in the, in the Bronx in New York, and uh, one of the things that, that I knew early on was I had an interest in foreign, um, not foreign, I was interested in um, public service. Um, and so um, I also knew that I wanted to work for the government, federal government. Um, I still don't know where that came from because my parents or my family wasn't, wasn't in the, for, weren't in the federal government, that, but that for some reason I wanted to work on big issues that affected a lot of people in a positive way. I guess that's the best way to explain it. So I knew I would uh, hopefully end up in Washington, D.C., but I first started working in New York City government because I wanted to see what city government was like. I went up to school in Albany because I wanted to see what state government was like. And then after that, I was fortunate to get a presidential management fellowship and came down to Washington, D.C. and worked at the Pentagon. Um, and it's where I was, it's when I was at the Pentagon that I was first exposed to issues of hard security, weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, nuclear, arms control, non-proliferation, disarmament issues. And um, after realizing that's what I wanted to do, and that's where I wanted to focus my international, uh, my law career, um, I decided to do international public law and uh, went to an, a, a, a place called the Arms Control Disarmament Agency, which actually doesn't exist anymore, uh, but was located at the State Department. And the main focus of that agency was providing individuals who focused specifically on, on arms control treaties, non-proliferation treaties, um, disarmament treaties, uh, not just the weapons of mass destruction, but also on chem uh, conventional weapons. Mm -hmm. And so it did the negotiations, it put the, you know, got the treaties ratified, um, uh, and also uh, served 
and led the work on the implementing implementing bodies that, that came out of these agreements. So I went there and I worked there for a while, uh, but that all came out of uh, interest in public service. And, you know, the... Um, your your PhD or your dissertation title um, uh, back in 2006 was uh, Why International Instruments to Combat Nuclear Proliferation Heat or Fail, uh, a study of the interaction of international and domestic level factors. And I know I'm going to simplify this a bit, but um, at the end of the day, you know, if we have country A that's interested in having nuclear weapons for security uh, and economic purposes versus the country B that wants it for power and prestige. Um, it's a lot easier once we we understand um, uh, basic motivations and we have leverage and can address certain incentives to come to country A, uh, a lot easier to move country A than country B. And I think, you know, I guess, for at least what I've seen a lot on TV with the nuclear negotiations, that's worked pretty well. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about this? Because I think uh, obviously a fascinating topic and, and clearly one that we care a lot about if it works or not in the negotiations. Yeah, thanks for thanks for that. And, um, you know, it also reminded me about my dissertation. You know, these, these things you never really think about it unless, you know, after you're done. Um, but yes, I mean, I wanted to look at, you know, you know, looking at decision makers and what motivates them to uh, either develop or not to develop or to get rid of uh, a nuclear weapons program. And I wanted to look at the the factors of um, the, you know, whether whether it's, you know, for security or power or prestige or economics, uh, but also looking at what's the role of you know, international treaties, like the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and uh, I had several case studies and pretty much came to the conclusion that uh, when it comes to power prestige, it's more likely countries will want to you know, develop nuclear weapons um, or hold on to weapons that they, that they have or acquired uh, more so than economic reasons. Um, and also it looked at, um, you know, the, as I said, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and you know, in, in, even in those cases, uh, when you have an international norm that's been developed, uh, power and prestige were often more, more of the reason why countries wanted those weapons. So, you know, in the current role, I mean, as I mentioned in the bio, you know, you, you have responsibility for uh, uh, several different agencies and, and and we'll talk about AUKUS later on, but basically uh, we have the Bureau of International Security Nonproliferation where we care that country A is not doing things with regard to weapons of mass destruction, uh, the arms control deterrence and stability, which is let's monitor that and then Bureau of Political Military Affairs, uh, country B is our ally. We care to supply them properly so that country A doesn't bother them with what they, what, what we want them not to do. Um, can you talk just a little bit about uh, the the agency in general? A little bit of sort of what your day is like, because clear, clearly there's a lot of things that come across your desk uh, with these uh, different uh, responsibilities across these bureaus. Uh, take us a little bit through that, if you would. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for that, that synopsis of the three bureaus, because uh, that's that's overall that's a pretty good pretty good synopsis. Um, so my day every day consists of um, as undersecretary, there's things that I have to do, um, you know, as an undersecretary. There's six undersecretaries, and so each undersecretary has several bureaus, and so there's things that we need to do on what they call the seventh floor. That's where the undersecretaries are. That's where the secretary is, the deputy secretary. So there's a number of management issues. There's a number of decision making that's done at that level. So that's part of the day. The other part is, of course, um, leading the three bureaus. And when I say leading, it's more overseeing um, because each bureau has an assistant secretary and the assistant secretaries really run the bureaus. They're also um, conferred by the Senate mm -hmm. and they pretty much they pretty much run the bureaus and I pretty much oversee um, all the bureaus. So, you know, but I'm also asked to do things like, um, you know, when they want to raise the level of something, they'll ask me to step in um, when I need to, you know, go and speak. Or I, I do a lot of bilateral work, a lot of I engage with countries based on um, uh, uh, issues that the three bureaus are promoting. So a lot of times I have to have meetings and, I, and I'm the person that brings all three together. So, 
you know, each assistant secretary focuses on each bureau, but as the undersecretary, I kind of have to know what's going on with all the bureaus. And so when I do my international meetings, when I do my bilateral uh, engagements, I'm pretty much promoting what all three bureaus are trying to promote. And I, I also work to try to tie, you know, themes and overall uh, uh, priorities for the bureaus and what we're trying to do. Um, so I'm kind of like that layer up here that's overseeing what's happening uh, in the in the bureaus themselves. And, and you know, I've heard you you know talk about uh, you know clearly a lot of what um, the different agencies do is, is uh, you know falls under this category of hard security. But you've also spoken uh, quite a bit on, on on the topic of soft security. There was a um, a talk you gave at uh, the the Henry Stimson Center in D.C. back in October uh, entitled "The Nexus of International Security in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals." And, and you know you talk about the balance here of hard and soft security. That uh, you know there's all these things that come after war. Uh, we don't want to. Yeah get the war but we have to think about clean drinking water and you know hunger and the threats of disease and uh gender equ equality um you know typical themes we don't normally think about with the hardest security side but you bring both of these to the table so talk a little bit about that as well i think it's very important yes um well a little bit of my a little bit more of my background to kind of put this in context when i, I used to work at the ford foundation and when i was at the ford foundation i used to fund activities either organizations other NGOs, sometimes multilateral forums and uh, organizations that were working on U.S. foreign and security policy. That was my title. but and, and that's where I had a lot of the hard security work. But I also have a smaller portfolio called Conflicts. Okay. And in this portfolio, I dealt with more of soft security. So I was always working kind of in both areas. Um, now, traditionally, people have, um, you know, had to, to silo, you know, People either work in one or the other, and that's pretty much still true today. But one of the things that um, I have found to be very interesting is really trying to understand how the two, how hard and soft security connect and areas mm -hmm. where they do connect, particularly as, you know, become more global and the problems that we face are more, it's more challenging to determine what's hard, you know, to, to make that distinction um, as well. Uh, but even as we have more problems just making distinctions between domestic and international, you know, because things are really affecting everything. Um, so that's one side of it. So I came in with that understanding. But also, um, there's a lot I recognize that when a lot, a lot of times when I have conversations with countries from the quote unquote global south, um, a lot of times when I'm talking about these hard security issues, they will ask legitimate questions about that's all important. But what are you doing related to development? What are you doing in terms of some of the issues that we see in the front lines that are in our our our, our security and, and most concerned security issues? And so I took that back and I said, you know, well, you know, having this understanding of both hard and soft security, these are legitimate questions. Um, our concerns and our our focus is not always going to be what they focus on. And so one of the things I did was I, I started to realize that there's actually a lot that we do in the quote unquote hard space that actually is helping to promote um positive things in the soft security side, in mm -hmm. the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. For example, I asked my my, my bureaus, all three bureaus, uh, to please look at all 17 of the SDGs and list out what we are doing in each one. And they came back with a, a paper that lists, it's like over 30 pages. It's like 36 pages of activities that we're doing in the hard security space that actually fits and promotes the SDGs. Um, and I did that uh, because I really wanted to see, and I didn't think it was going to be 32 pages. I thought it'd be like five, six, seven pages. But I was so impressed by all the things we're doing. I think it was also helpful for them that they could also see all the many things that we're doing uh, to help. So that's why I did the speech and I'm, I'm a real proponent of understanding the connections between the two. Excellent. Excellent. And, and speaking of uh, the SDGs, so, you know, SDG number three is, is all about good health and well-being. And, and I was not able to get to the fact that uh, in the bio that, you know, one of the, your responsibilities back in the uh, sort of 2014-2017 range, you led the uh, our efforts on the global health security agenda, which was, uh, you know, a group of, I think, 70 some odd countries, different international institutes and, and NGOs looking at how we build resilience, you know, around the world per preventing 
detecting uh, at the time Ebola and Zika, but you know we we, we moved on from there. Um, and, and there was a couple of really interesting papers that you published at the time. Um, one of them had actually had to do with uh, activities right around the corner here at University of Pennsylvania. It was entitled "Pandemic Simulation Framework and Innovation Approach to Increase Student Interest and in Confidence in Disaster Preparedness and Response." Um, I thought that was fascinating because you know clearly uh, we need this resilience uh, across these different infectious diseases, whether they're new or emerging. Um, say a few words about this, because I think this is a, a really interesting, clearly the, the WMD basket is, is not just nuclear, it has other important things in there. Um, say a couple words about that and a little bit of the time you spent uh, uh, with the Penn folks, really interesting part of the story. Yeah, and the, thanks for that. And the, the time I spent with the Penn folks uh, um, was following, uh, you mentioned the work that I did in, in the government before then in the Global Health Security Agenda. And what this was, as you mentioned, is was an effort to build sustainability or rather build capacity, saving almost, build capacity in countries to be able to um, combat infectious diseases. And this is before, I, this was like before Ebola happened, but there was a recognition that there was, that there was a growing um, threat out there in terms of infectious diseases and a, a need to really look at how countries' capacity exists, uh, what the capacity exists in countries around the world to deal with this. And so we were looking at it in terms of, you know, whether whether a disease is natural or accidental or um, intentional, the way in which we have to address it remains the same. You know, mm -hmm. there may be different issues if it's an intentional, for example, you're going to get agencies and departments like FBI or Interpol involved because then right. it's more of an intentional thing. But once it happens, you know, we still got to figure out what it is. We still got to figure out, you know, um, the, how we deal with it. We just went through all that with COVID. Right. Um, so, um, so that was the way in which we started to have more of the intentional, the people work on the intentional side, which is my offices, mm -hmm. which work on biosafety, biosecurity stuff to, you know, secure biopathogens, so non-state actors with intent to do harm don't get their hands on it, for example. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then the natural accidental brings in like Center for Disease Control and, and, and you know, HHS, Health and Human Services, USDA, um, Department of Agriculture, and others. So we all started to work together, this whole government approach. Um, and, and, that, and, and the work we do there also uh, does help in terms of that SDG that you mentioned, number three. So when I went to U University of Pennsylvania, one of the things I did when I was a fellow at the uh, at the Penn Center at the um, Prairie World House was talk to a number of professors and deans because the University of Pennsylvania, you know, it's a campus that actually has all the schools right. in, in, all in one huge campus. It's easy to get around to different schools. And so I said, why don't we develop a simulation? And this simulation would be based on uh, this idea that there was an infectious disease. Um, and keep in mind, this is all before COVID. <laughs> yeah. This is after Ebola, uh, but before COVID, there'd be an infectious disease and the different schools would, uh, we have students from the different schools figure out how they would deal with it based on their areas of specialization. So similar to what we did in the government, where we had different departments and agencies pulling together. What I wanted to do was help the younger generation mm -hmm. deal with the, figure out how they would deal with an infectious disease. So we had people from the medical school, the dental school, the yep. vet school, the communication school, uh, the pharmacy school, um, uh, education school, mm -hmm. uh, all come together. And that's what that's what it was. And we did it about three times. But it, it was but I grew out of the work that I had done uh, with the Global Health Security Agenda. And, and um, moving from 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 biologic um, to, to radiologic now, um, because another thing I, I did not mention your bio, but you, you also, um, you know, during that period served as chairperson uh, on the Committee on Radioactive Sources uh, at the, the National Academy of Sciences. And, you know, I, I um, there were some reports, uh, one of them was uh, radioactive sources application alternative technologies. Uh, a couple of, last year, I had um, a Dr. Uh, Nishat Mathur on from IAEA, uh, you know, talking about, you know, obviously radiation does a lot of useful stuff, whether it's, you know, radionucleotides and cancer therapy, they do a pretty good job of killing viruses. And she talked about their Zodiac program. Um, clearly, you know, this is an area that, you know, we have to think about the dual use, you know, on one hand, we 
we need these important isotopes, but at the same time, uh, dirty bombs and all that stuff are, are kind of scary. Talk a little bit of what you discussed and some of the things you thought about when you were when you were working on sort of this committee and uh, in terms of the dual use concepts. Yeah, I mean a lot of a lot of that work, and I actually had to to part that early so I could be in this job. But a lot of that work was really focusing on um, how you know how, you know the the um, how do we best protect ourselves regarding radiological weapons, not weapons, radiological sources? Um, you know, the different um, the different ways the International Atomic Energy Agency was addressing different types of radiological um, sources, and whether the the IAEA uh, needed to strengthen some of its um, ways in which it was categorizing some of these radiological sources based on their um, you know the 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 negative results that could happen if there was a, what they call a dirty bomb if somebody used radiological sources uh, to actually build a bomb um, and so that was a it was very interesting because um, I was not the expert in the room there were a lot of I mean I know a lot about it but I'm not I'm not a, 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 a scientist in that respect um, so it was it was really uh, a great opportunity to learn not only from the other people who were on the committee, but also many of the individuals that came and talked about it. But it also was an opportunity to raise a level of, of focus on radiological sources because, you know, we focus a lot on chemical, bio, nuclear, of course, but radiological sources is something that um, we wanted to give more attention to because a lot more countries have radiological material than nuclear material. I mean, nuclear material is, you know, it's, it's uh, highly rich uranium and plutonium which most countries don't have, but everyone has radiological sources, whether it's in, in whether it's in the hospitals, whether it's in universities. Um, and so it does need to get, it does need to get a little more attention. And that's one of the reasons why the committee was focusing on that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in addition to, you know, as I mentioned, in addition to the three agencies, you have this fourth major responsibility now, which is uh, AUKUS, which is this, um, it, partnership, security partnership in the Indo-Pacific region, which, you know, broadly covers, you know, not just nuclear power submarines, but, you know, all sorts of the sort of the high tech tools that we've been talking about on the show in terms of AI, the quantum computing, the autonomy, hypersonics, um, you know, and this comes to the theme, I know, you know, you've given talks, you know, I've seen about, uh, obviously, the importance of STEM education. Uh, and there's really two pieces here, right? There's uh, we have to stay up to date with the, this really cutting edge stuff. Uh, at the same time, we have to get keep people interested in in building submarines and ships. And, and I saw a recently, you know, an interview you gave at um, uh, this was for the New, Newport New Shipbuilding Apprentice School, which is you know one of our I guess only two uh, shipyards capable of designing these 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 novel submarines. Um, talk about sort of the educating the next generation, the importance of STEM, but also um, sort of the breadth there, because, you know, we want people to be on the cutting edge, but at the same time, we need people, uh, you know, just like, you know, Arapa said we did with the uh, secretary uh, Jacobs Young at USDA. We, we we want technology. We also want farmers to be, to want to farm. Um, same sort of thing here. Talk a little bit about this, if you would. Yes. Uh, well, STEM is such an important part of what I do. I mean, so many of the, the, the talent that I have around me is, is, is of course, international relations and diplomacy, but also STEM because of the science uh, background that's required for a lot of these, a lot of these things. And I rely very much on the expertise of scientists and in, in, in the work I do. And so does, you know, uh, folks here on the diplomatic side of State Department, but in other parts of the government that do work on these issues. So STEM remains a very important part of the work. I think it will always remain an important part of the work that we do, of course. But also, as you mentioned, AUKUS. I mean, um, AUKUS is uh, what we call generational because it's going to be around for so long. We're talking about 70, 80 years from now um, and longer probably. So it's generational in the sense that we have to make sure that there are people who can do this work. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, you know, I visited the shipyard, which was a great experience and talked to the students there. And my main message was that to them was to continue to be interested in these work, in this work, uh, to talk about AUKUS and the future of AUKUS and we're going to be needing people who do emerging technologies for many years to come. Um, and so, you know, emerging technology is so new and there's a lot of new things there, but we still need, you know, um, 
they'll break STEM and, and math and engineering and things like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, it really was to talk about that. And we do need that for the future, not just for um, what we do here in, in my bureaus, but also for AUKUS uh, in, in the future and the opportunities there are to work with um, experts from other countries like the UK and Australia in doing this. Um, I am sure that there will always be, um, it, you know, we're always struggling to get to ensure we have enough people working in STEM to make sure this continues. So um, I'm sure there's lots of opportunities for other things that other people will be working on that they find for their careers. But I think uh, increasing STEM and increasing representation in STEM so that it's also diverse um, in terms of the people who are in it is very, very important. It's something that we're trying to, we're going to be promoting for a while. Mm-hmm. And, and on that note, uh, again, what I did not mention in the in your bio is that in addition to to all your responsibilities, you are also the uh, the founder and served as executive director and board chair of Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security, uh, a leading advocacy organization to support women of color in security and peace building. Um, you also founded a group called Organization Solidarity. Um, say a couple words about both these organizations, and I noticed uh, just. I guess a couple of days ago, you were at the, the Munich Security Conference, and the topic of your talk there was confronting escalating anti-feminism and authoritarianism, safeguarding women's rights in urgent global context. Um, say a few words about your, your talk, if you would, uh, on that theme, too. Yeah. Uh, first, about um, uh, the organization that I started, but the one that you mentioned first, Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security in Conflict Transformation, or WCAPS. I found it in 2017 really as a way to um, build a network of women of color who work in the fields of peace and security. And here I'm talking about both hard and soft security mm -hmm. um, to build a network so that um, there's a support system for women who often feel like they're the only ones in the room um, to help encourage them to want to stay in the fields, because if you have a support system, you want to stay in the field, but also to uh, ensure that there's a recognition that there are very qualified women of color uh, in these different areas of work. I can say that I have on my staff uh, some very qualified uh, women uh, working on these issues, and um, you know it's 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 great to be able to showcase uh, the skills that are out there because very often um, people are saying we don't know women of color who do this work, and so I do what I can to make sure people understand that there are these women do exist. Um, and organizing solidarity, I started after the George Floyd uh, murder, where a number of our WCAPS members were. You know, we did a had a chance to speak to a number of maybe the day afterwards, and many were were upset that their organizations did not, in their view, um, recognize some of the things that they were going through, the the emotional challenges they were having, and so this was an opportunity to work with a number of organizations to promote more understanding, uh, of course, diversity issues uh, as well, uh, but finding ways in which they could work together. The we uh, WCAS we wrote a twelve we wrote a paper uh, that had twelve points in it. We had over hundred hundred organizations sign on to it, and we had twelve points about what we think organizations should do in these kind of situations. and And we had the organizations focus each focus on at least one of these twelve, and that's how it started to go forward. Um, so that's the that's the 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 origination region the reasons why I started those two organizations, and then in, in Munich. Uh, which is is which is great because despite or well in addition to the the number of activities that are going on, uh, there are always a number of really good side events and they, there are a number of them that look at that look at issues of gender, look at issues of women in these security areas, and um, this one we had uh, the prime minister from Estonia speak. We had a uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate there. They always have amazing women who are there, who are speaking about some of their uh, challenges, uh, some of the some of the changes that's going on uh, in terms of um, governments, which are being seen as much more um, uh, um, non-feminist <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. in their in their viewpoints and their uh, and so that's always a, a issue of discussion about the future and how do we continue to challenge. Um, uh, these perspectives that are not really favorable to women and gender perspectives. Um, so it was it was a really good opportunity to be there with other women, hear from them. I had other opportunities to speak about um, the importance of diversity in these fields. 
Um, so it was good to not only talk about the substance, but the other things that also make a strong foreign policy in, in these issues. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, speaking of strong foreign policy, uh, you know, we can and we'll put the links in, in a bio of the show. We, we can follow your uh, Twitter account and, and, you know, see all the, the dignitaries and ambassadors and ministers that, that you meet with on a daily basis. You know, I, you do a lot of traveling, uh, you know, say the, the, the meeting security uh, meeting. Um, anything coming up that we should know about uh, in the following months? Obviously, <laughs> extremely busy schedule, but any public facing stuff that I did not touch on that uh, maybe coming up in the next um, few months well, that you want to highlight, please? Well, um, tomorrow I'm going to be speaking at the Korea Society um, in New York. I think there's a link for that. Um, I don't know about the speaking engagements, um, off the top of my head, though I'm sure I have a, I have a calendar of things in it. Um, but that's the one that's most immediate. And I'll be talking about extended deterrence issues, uh, at the Korea Society. But follow my Twitter account because everything's there. <laughs> both that, definitely my, well. Both, uh, both my government and my personal, there's lots of stuff there. So. Got it. Well, I, I, we do follow your Twitter account. I also follow your LinkedIn. And so, you know, we get to the point of the show here with the, the fun question. Well, it's all been fun questions. But um, about six months ago was the, uh, the the 50th anniversary of hip hop. And, and you remarked in your LinkedIn that, you know, you were there in the early days uh, in the South Bronx when, when this all unfolded. I have to say that, you know, I went to school with one of the founders of the Source magazine. So I, I, okay. I guess I saw it unfolding in Philadelphia. Um, there's a Bonnie Jenkins that has a SoundCloud profile. It seems like a bunch of, I don't know if that's you but there's a bunch of new stuff uh what, what do you listen what, what type of music are you interested in the old school uh do you like the new uh, the new stuff that's come I, out and, I'm, and, yeah i'm still kind of an old school i still listen to um 80s 90s music mostly a lot of 80s music because that was i think a decade when there was just so much diversity you had rock you had hard rock you had soft rock you had r&b you had you had the beginnings of rap. You had um, you, you um, uh, two or three other genres that were there, and it was so diverse. Some a lot there was a lot of music I didn't like because of it was, some of it was a little uh, much, and some of and there's a lot that I did like. So I I listen to a lot of that. I mean, I listen to some of the music today, but it's just um, I mean, I guess we all say that when we get older, it's not like it's not like it used to be. Um, but yeah, I mean, I grew up in South Bronx and, and hip hop started in the South Bronx. And I was young and I was hanging out in the playgrounds, you know, with my friends. And I remember, um, you know, you know, a couple of times people bringing their, you know, their, you know, of course, back then we had the albums. So bringing their vinyls and that's how they mixed yep. it with the vinyls and in the part in the playground uh, and us dancing and people doing um uh, you know, those dances where they spin on their head and stuff like that, uh, break dancing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it, it's, uh, you know, when they talk about the beginning of hip hop, they used to talk about the South Bronx and it was right in my playground when all that started. So That's it's pretty cool. cool. Yeah, I was, I was just going to, this is not mine, but uh, th this is my daughter's um, Fat Boy LP and, and Fat Boy LP. And, and um, yeah, so I, you can see how I've influenced her, uh, not just with the, <laughs> with, with the LPs, but with old school. So, yeah, that, that's, uh, but she's in tall. <laughs> I thought yeah. I'd bring it up. And... Well, it's good to have, I mean, I have a, I have on my Spotify, it's, I call it my, my life's journey. And I have music from when I was, you know, even before, you know, I, I used to play my mom's and my dad's albums. That's what we did back in the day. Um, So I do about music even before I was born, which I think they don't do very much of now. I'm amazed at how many young people have not heard of. People are like, you sure you heard of, how did I have heard of that? But I think because of music, the way music is done these days, it's not yeah. like you pick up your mom dead album. It's just like whatever's on right. Spotify. <laughs> but yeah, it's my it's like my journey. And so I put all the music that I've listened to in my life and including up to now. Um, you know, so um, but a lot more of the old school is what I like. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Well, uh Ambassador, I could say it was really, um, you know, honor talking to you, you know, hearing about your journey, everything that you're involved in um, to to keep us safe, to 
to keep the world safe, um, you know, and um, just really appreciate it and you know, wishing you the best as you continue with, you know, running all these agencies and of course the Duocus program. Um, again, for everybody who is going to be listening uh, to this particular episode of our show, you know, across the various podcast networks, or who'll be watching on the YouTube channel. Again, you've been spending time with Ambassador Dr. Bonnie Jenkins, Undersecretary for Arms Control, International Security at the United States Department of State. Um, Dr. Jensen, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule again. Obviously, thank you for everything you do. Uh, thank you for the service to the United States. And as we like to say here on our show, you know, thanks for helping to create a better and safer tomorrow via the types of things you do. Really a great story. Ray, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate this opportunity to, to talk and also go back in memory lane for a bit. So <laughs> thanks a lot. Great, Abigail.